Hello and welcome to Stand Up from the Road. I took a few days off and I'm continuing to travel this week now on the way to do a gig in West Virginia at the National Conservation Training Center, which is a federal government facility run by an old friend and listener of mine, Steve Chase. He's the director there. And every year, almost every year, I go down there to address the Native Youth Climate Adaptation Leadership Congress, a, an amazing group of young tribal kids, students from across the country and beyond, and I always learn a lot from them and hopefully teach them a little bit about media and politics and everything else that I'm talking about with them, but always a a great time. Not enough time, though, to record a a whole bunch of new interviews for it this week, but so much going on. I'll definitely address it. Hope to see you at tomorrow night's hangout. I'm going to be on the road, so trying to figure out how to make that work. But today, I've got climate scientist Dr. Michael Mann, who was at Penn State University, but now he's going to Philadelphia to be an Ivy League professor at the University of Pennsylvania, and I I look forward to working with him there to address some of what they hired him for, to talk about media when it comes to climate and science and politics. So very excited about my conversation with Dr. Michael Mann and sharing it with you. I know it's stand-up light this week, so much that is happening in the world between the Supreme Court overturning Roe v. Wade, women's reproductive rights, the January 6th hearings with this uh, amazing young woman, Cassidy Hutchinson. Is that her name? I didn't really watch the testimony because, like I said, I'm on a hybrid week off slash work week. Hard to explain, but I appreciate you staying with me and supporting me here on the podcast. We'll get back to the normal format and find new formats and ideas. So keep those ideas coming. Keep those vitamin N photos coming. I'm taking some of my own and getting some of my own. Stand up with Pete at gmail.com. Stand up with Pete.com to sign up for a paid subscription, which I would love to have you do and be a part of our community. But right now, it's time for Dr. Michael Mann, who is a climatologist, a geophysicist. He was the director of the Earth System Science Center at Penn State University. Now, like I said, headed to University of Pennsylvania. He's written several books, including a new children's book, The Tantrum That Saved the World, and his latest book on climate, The New Climate War. So, so good. If you haven't gotten that yet, you really should. He's most well-known for the hockey stick and the climate wars, I would imagine, dispatches from the front lines. And he's awesome on Twitter, at Michael E. Mann. You can also find him on Facebook and Instagram, as well as michaelmann2ends.net. Ladies and gentlemen, let's do it. Misunderstood. She thought I was a climate change denier. <laughs> you got, but now I'm recording. I want this for the record. Bette Midler attacked you on Twitter because she thought she mis- she misunderstood something. Yeah, I, for- I forget what it was, but um, she, and this happens often on Twitter. I, I do it with other people, but she misinterpreted it and thought that I was a climate change denier. <laughs> <laughs> Well, usually people just misinterpret and think that you're a filmmaker. So that's not that bad. Well, right. Or there's the porn star, too. But we won't talk about him. I didn't know. But the weird thing about him is he looks exactly like you. I'm not sure how you've gotten away with this. (laughs) It's my twin. It's it's not me. It's my twin. (laughs) Anyway, it's great to see you, my friend. I'm glad you could uh, make some time to join me. I always I pretty much want to talk to you every week. I wonder if, you know, there's there's some positive things to say at all about anything because one of the reasons I don't talk to you every week is I always get worried it'll be dour and and down but your new book has a lot of optimism in it so yeah th- thanks Pete it's always great to uh, talk with you and yeah you know there um there are obviously reasons um if you're looking for reasons to be concerned or even pessimistic there there are so many of them today and I think that that has in part, I I think it's the sort of that context, um, the sort of larger challenges that we face often leads people to sort of a a doom and gloom attitude uh, about everything. And that includes climate change. And so oddly, it it sometimes leads people to really, really misunderstand uh, the science in a way that feeds this narrative of, of doom when in fact an objective you know, assessment of the scientific evidence, as I continue to try to explain to people, tells us that, yeah, climate change is bad. We can see the devastating consequences play out, but it's not too late to prevent the worst consequences. And uh, ironically, it's that sort of thinking, that thinking that it is too late, that could ultimately lead us to not take the actions that are necessary to, you know, avert 
truly catastrophic climate change. That's a message in my uh, latest book in the new climate war. But it's also a message that's implicit in the book that I'm literally about to finish. I'm halfway through the final chapter. Uh, It's called The Benevolent Moment. I love that. Yeah. And it's it's about this sort of, you know, we, um, you know, civilization arose during this window of relative climate stability. Mm. And it's that stability that's allowed us to create, you know, this the civilization that, you know, literally supports nearly eight billion people on this planet. Obviously, anything that threatens that stability threatens that infrastructure threatens us as a species. And so it's really about the lessons that we can draw from the record of past Earth history, from paleoclimate, distant changes in climate in the past, you know, when the dinosaurs roamed the planet, when, you know, the primordial ooze, you know, that life first uh, emerged uh, from lifeless oceans, all of the lessons that we can learn from the past about what we face now. And in the end, if you objectively look at what the evidence has to say, it again sort of points toward that middle ground. It's not the end of the world. It's also not good for us. Climate change is is a true crisis, but the science tells us there's time to act to prevent it from literally becoming civilization ending. Right. That's the bottom line. And let's go from there, and you can read more about it in Michael's a new book. And now this the next book, which you just crank them out, even a children's book, which if you haven't gotten that for your kids, that's really good. And now I can't find the well, title. We've got all those elves, you know, that are churning out these books. It's, you know, that's how we do You're it. like James Patterson, minus the weird racist comments he made the other day. <laughs> What's, what, <laughs> what is up with that? I, there's a, you know, I'll defend it. I'll defend, like, white men of a certain age realizing <laughs> that they don't have the same opportunities they did but i'd say that's more about age than anything than race but at the same time uh that's happened to me like it's happened to me in my entertainment career where now you're getting some people will even say you know we we don't want a white guy we're looking for a black woman or something and i guess i could react with anger and envy i guess i could but it would seem would seem weird what with how much Unfucking believable opportunity I've had up until. <laughs> so that's a weird thing, I, you know. But yeah, I hear you. I hear you, my friend. Okay, so what I wanted to ask you though was: are, Have you become a Supreme Court scholar, given so many issues regarding climate regulating pollution specifically, have come before this court, including one that hasn't been announced yet? But West Virginia versus EPA might be announced even before I, uh, you know, post this. So. <laughs> But the challengers are uh, to this are 27 Republican attorneys general from states with traditions in the fossil fuel industry is how it's written at NPR, Michael. But anyway, they want to be able to uh, regulate or uh, attack the Obama era clean power plan and the Trump era affordable clean energy rule, which are currently in effect. And so there's a lot of uh, political jargon or, or legal jargon I've talked with scholars about. But you understand yeah. this from a science point of view about regulating pollution and how in the U.S. Uh, it needs to happen as well as on the planet because borders don't stop pollution is my understanding. Yeah. Yeah. You know, sort of fossil fuel interests and the Republicans who do their bidding have for years been trying to uh, attack what's known as the endangerment finding. It was a Supreme Court decision that the EPA doesn't indeed have the right to regulate uh, carbon emissions as a pollutant. Um, And ironically, there were Republicans like uh, Christine Todd Whitman, who was the uh, EPA administrator under during the first term of of, uh, George George W. W, Right. What's that? Oh, no. Was it W W or uh, W? It was W. Yeah, yeah. she was. um, She was a former governor of uh, of New Jersey and and then went on to become EPA administrator under George W. Bush. Dick Cheney and his friends in the energy industry ended up forcing her out before the end of the first term because she indeed supported and George W. Bush supported regulating carbon emissions as a pollutant. And the Supreme Court, you know, has continued to affirm the government's, you know, legal authority to enforce those sorts of regulations. That hasn't changed. 
The Constitution hasn't changed. What's changed is the makeup of the court. Right. And so what decisions that were a no brainer for past courts, even with conservative justices, that, of course, the EPA has the right to regulate you know, uh, pollutants, including carbon emissions that are carbon pollution that threaten our planet. Of course, they have the right to do that. But with this Supreme Court, you know, there, there's no way of knowing how far down this road of, ironically, what you would have to call judicial activism, they're willing to go. Yeah, well, you could call it judicial judicial activism. Uh, I like to at this point say that they're they're not even justices. They're just I mean, you could say that for all of them. Christine Todd Whitman. Here it is. 2003. Christine Todd Whitman announced her resignation yesterday as head of the EPA, ending a bumpy ride, which she tried without success to counter the influence of other Bush administration officials who favored industry interests over the environment. That's how the Baltimore Sun put it. Yeah, yeah. she was pushed out by Rick oil. Janey. Yeah. yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. Crazy. I, I didn't I didn't realize I never knew that. And, and W, and to his credit, was on the right side of this issue. And even w- during the uh, the campaign, hmm. in fact, in, in a in a previous book of mine, uh, The Hockey Stick in the Climate Wars, uh, I, I, I start one of the chapters with this excerpt. And I tell the reader that this is an excerpt from one of the two candidates candidates in the 2000 election on the campaign trail and you read it it's about climate change is a problem we need to do something about it you would be convinced it was al gore but it wasn't it was w that's crazy that's wild i uh, but yeah i guess the way i've always remembered it mike is that climate became a, a, a major controversy when when the solution to it was to tax polluters and those polluters in turn you know, told the, the politicians that they basically owned. No, that I think we're good. And then be, be, then became the political pa- campaign, of course, that attacked you and all the rest of scientists. Is that right? Uh, in a nutshell. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Uh, let me ask you <clears throat> a, 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 about curriculum. There's a story that you were quoted for, for I think, from the Scientific American it's titled Subverting Climate Science in the Classroom. Oil and gas representatives influenced the standards for courses and textbooks from kindergarten to 12th grade. And we're talking about specifically in Texas, I think, here. And we've heard a lot about the Texas Republican Party and their convention. But this is an issue that I'm dealing with at my BOE right now in upstate yeah. New York. This is an issue with, with elementary and, and, and public school across the country. Can you give us a little history and, and kind of un- help us understand where we're at in terms of educating kids, kids about the scientific consensus on the climate crisis? Yeah, well, you know, there, there's been a, a long term campaign by conservative activists to try to you know, introduce religion into the classroom to, in essence, um, put pressure on teachers, on school boards, et cetera, to to basically implement a conservative agenda within our uh, high school curricula. And in the past, that has largely failed because, you know, reasonable people have turned out, have run to be on school boards. Uh, School boards typically have been made up of, of people who have a reasonable uh, viewpoint about these matters. What's changed right now, as you probably know, is that conservative activists are now trying to take over our government at every level. And yes. that comes all the way down to, uh, you know, small town school boards. And they want to implement a, a reactionary agenda, which includes climate denial. I just don't agree with conservative activists because it gives them a kind of a, a light of being serious. They're just conservative. We disagree with them. No, no. They're conspiratorial people yeah. who, who, who want to tear I, down public education. They don't have an alternative curriculum. They just want to tear it down. They have no idea, Michael, right. you know, the, the ones we're dealing with, anything about yeah. education. And once they got, if they got, if they got on the board, they would be like, what did I sign up for? This is boring. No, and there's an understanding of the world is the, the canon of QAnon. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes, exactly. It's a good way of putting it. They are conspiracy theorists that when it comes to science, who knows what they want kids to learn, I guess, or not learn, more importantly. But this has been going on kind of forever, right? I mean, the boards of education or those that make up curriculum are in states like Louisiana and Texas and other oil states have heavy influence on what students learn about energy and electricity and generation, much less climate, don't they? 
Yeah, you know, it, 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 this conversation reminds me of one of my favorite films, uh, Planet of the Apes, uh, <laughs> starring, of course, Charlton Heston, who it turns out was uh, both an environmental uh, activist and a, a, a pro-teaching-of-evolution activist uh, as well in two of the main roles he played in, so funny. In, in the movie Soylent Green. It's premised, of course, if you watch the very beginning of it, on climate change. <laughs> if you, in The Planet of the Apes, you find out, of course, in that ironic twist that's uh, characteristic of Rod Serling's writing screenplays, The Twilight Zone. Uh, you, you find out that, you know, of course, that the apes had been hiding evidence that there were once intelligent human beings. <laughs> and, you know, it's it's literally come to that, right? It's not that these, you know, uh, ideologues have a legitimate alternative worldview, they just want to sabotage efforts to instill a sensible worldview to the next generation. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So well said, uh, of course. I, I, I don't think I, I've never seen Soylent Green. Should I? I don't need to, do I? Absolutely. Oh, it's great. Really? Yeah. I mean, you know, it's <laughs> <laughs> it, it's campy in certain ways, but it's actually it's mm. pretty remarkable because. That film really predated any widespread public concern about climate change. And so I sort of joke that Charlton Heston was sort of uh, was in some ways prophetic in starring in a sure. film that was premised on the disastrous consequences of human caused climate change. It's also a good piece of evidence, a good data point as to when even sci fi writers were were aware of this real threat. I mean, it's not right. like it's new. We always need to, I think, remind people. Well, sci sci-fi writers, it's an interesting point you raise. Uh, we're often really sort of tapped in to um, the science itself, to the scientific literature. And so they would often introduce ideas that existed within the scientific community, but hadn't yet been heard by the public. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, that's interesting way of, of seeing. Of course they did. Yeah, because they're it would only make sense for creative people to do to do such things. So and there's so many other movies that we're watching now that are are dystopian as well that are out. Uh, what is it right now, Michael, as we talk in mid-June? Do you see the layout of the current movement on any kind of legislation that would make a big difference addressing climate here here in the U.S.? <laughs> and I think I guess the only thing that really matters to talk about is the is the filibuster rule. And that's the problem, because, yeah. of course, Democrats have long been passing this legislation out of the House when they had majorities. But then it gets stuck in the Senate. Is that still right. where we are at? And there's not that much to talk about this legislation that could potentially be pared down and passed. Yeah, I wish I had some, you know, special insight into that that I could offer you. I I don't really know much more than than you do about sort of where we are yeah. other than you know, the fact that there do seem to be serious conversations right now with Joe Manchin, who is the primary obstacle to passing sort of a, a climate bill or the climate provisions of the, you know, uh, of the Build Back Better bill. The primary obstacle uh, was his unwillingness to to join the other Democrats and pass this through reconciliation with 50 votes and a tie breaking vote by a vice, the vice president. My understanding is that there are now serious conversations hmm. that that he is on board with some sort of you know, climate bill. And I imagine what we'll end up getting is sort of what we appear to be getting with this uh, gun legislation. There are going to be some concessions. Democrats are going to be able to pass something, but it's going to be uh, far from the, the wish list. And, and so, you know, if I have a little bit of optimism that something can be done here, it's an outgrowth of the fact that I never thought we would see any sort of right. crossover, uh, Republican crossover on, on gun legislation. And we are seeing that. Well, hold on, though. While we're seeing that on gun legislation, have you heard of any Republican senators signing on to climate? Because, it, as you just said, it would it would even take the tiebreaker vote would be Kamala Harris. There's no Republicans. My understanding, it's only and uh, Manchin and is cinema as, as well uh, standing in the way of. Climate. I think it's just Manchin because he loves himself. From West yeah, Virginia and cinema doesn't seem to be um, uh, an obstacle in this particular uh, okay. um, matter. Um, but no so Republican really senators. Uh, and my uh, guess is if Manchin gives his blessing, the uh, cinema will too. Right, right. That's sort of been 
the way it's worked before. But, you know, again, you know, there, there is sort of there are probably at least six or seven. It doesn't get you up to uh, 60, but there's six or seven Republicans who secretly support some sort of climate action. But because of the current, you know, the prevailing uh, political environment have, have refused to come out of the closet on, on climate, as it were. Right, right. <laughs> um, could, you, could you get all the way to 60? Probably not. But my guess is that if you could get five or six Republicans, that would make someone like Joe Manchin far more comfortable in passing this through reconciliation. If Great. there were some votes. No, that's public. that's expert political analysis from uh, a scientist. It, it's just a guess. It's armchair po- uh, political analysis from a scientist. Well, yes. I'll take it from you uh, from you. I always love to get, you know, people on this show out of their wheelhouse. You know, we're not limited so tightly for time. And, you know, everybody knows that I'm going to try to do that to you. And I and, you know, you're always <laughs> tweeting about politi- politics and stuff, too. You've been obviously been been dragged into it uh, for well, years. I'd like, like to say, Pete. I didn't come to politics. It came to yeah, me. Exactly. Uh, all right. Well, before I let you go, let, let me just ask you about kind of, you know, what your thoughts are on the current energy crisis. You know, the most animating issue has always kind of been the price of of energy is specifically a gallon of gas, because obviously people always talk about the consumer sees that uh, they pay attention to that. Even someone who's not paying attention to any other issue in the world, they know how much gas costs. And then furthermore, everything else costs more when the price of fuel goes up. And add to that a pandemic and a war, which are the primary causes of inflation, not government spending, obviously, certainly gas prices. What are your thoughts about right now when gas prices are are so high, you know, these other forms of energy and everything else I just mentioned? What do you see? What do you think of when this happens? Yeah, you know, I forget there was a Democratic operative who once said something like never, you know, never waste a crisis or, or something. <laughs> never fail to take advantage of a crisis. Yeah, yeah. I think maybe Rahm Emanuel was quoted. Uh, the Rahm, yeah. Rahm Emanuel, there it is. Yep. Thank you. Well, you know, that's Republicans have learned that lesson, right? And so what's going on right now mm-hmm. is, you know, an effort to exploit this short term challenge that we have. We're coming out of the pandemic. Much of the inflationary pressure is because of this growth, this dramatic growth of the you know economy as we emerge from this uh, pandemic-driven recession. And, and that's going to have impacts on energy prices and everything else. And, and we have supply chain interruptions. We've got the situation in Ukraine. All of these factors have come together uh, in a perfect storm. But the consequences are short-term. Th- those factors will, you know, eventually disappear in a, in a matter of a year, two years, three years. And so what we have to make sure not to do is to allow ourselves to be conned into putting in place long term fossil fuel infrastructure that will keep us addicted to fossil fuels for decades. What we can not allow is for the, sh- the current short term challenges to lead us to make long-term decisions that keep us addicted to fossil fuels. If anything, what we're seeing right now is an, is a lesson in the, the dangers of our continued reliance on fossil fuels. The, the crisis in the Ukraine, the Russian aggression against uh, Ukraine, is an outgrowth of the fact that they are a petrostate. And the, and, and, and the reason we haven't taken greater action, your, certain European countries in particular, haven't taken greater action is because of the cudgel that uh, Russia is able to to hold uh, to use um, as, uh, you know, a source of of gas and and oil to uh, various European countries. And so the lesson here is how dangerous it is for us to remain addicted to fossil fuels and to prop up these petro states like Russia and Saudi Arabia. Uh, We've been we've been we've learned this lesson for well, how many years, 40 years about the wars in the in the Gulf. And you're seeing it right now. I read the statistic. Obviously, we haven't learned this lesson, right? (laughs) Yeah, fair fair enough. I mean, I just remember Tom Ricks, the the military historian talking about this, I think. Yeah, just post 9-11. And and I read a couple days ago that the ruble is doing great. The Russian currency is doing fine. We all thought it was going to crash. One of the reasons is India wasn't buying any Russian oil, and now they're getting it on the cheap. And Russia's oil sales are doing absolutely fine because of uh, India and China specifically. And so that war can continue in that country. 
doesn't suffer even with all of these sanctions the way that we might have hoped because yeah. they're now they're, they're they're selling the oil uh, at a discount to the most populated countries in the world that need it. If we had alternative sources, we wouldn't have yeah. to be dealing no, you're with right. them. I mean, the way we have to view this from a geopolitical standpoint is that China and India have sided with Russia. That's that's what they've done. They have sided with Russia in this unprecedented uh, aggression against Ukraine. And, you know, that's um, Saudi Arabia as well. And it really sort of to me, you know, the fact that uh, that Biden, the Biden administration is now, you know, sort of reaching out to Saudi Arabia uh, is a grave concern to me. Yeah, no doubt about it. It looks terrible. It feels terrible. And I'm not sure we have any any option but to, to do it. I don't know. I'm not sure. It, it's it's tough. And again, the, the short term challenges and the longer term challenges. Yep. And we have to try to, to keep those separate. Yeah. Uh, so you can't talk about any personal or career stuff that was private, I think. Like, can I put anything on the record? Anything new that you want to share? Oh, uh, well, um, I'm, I'm starting this new position at the University of Pennsylvania. This, OK, uh, I wasn't sure if yeah. you you said that on record or not, but I knew that. So it, yeah, right? yeah, yep. It's Great. on the record. Great. Yeah. Very exciting that he's, he's gone Ivy on us. What will that change about how you talk to us and treat us? Well, um, I'm going to be directing a new center there uh, for science, sustainability and the media. And so Ooh. this is an opportunity for me to sort of bring together my, my two passions, science and, and, and science communication and public yes. outreach. Yes. Three, actually. <laughs> um, but uh, the, the university came to me and, you know, they offered um, the resources that uh, I felt uh, I needed to do something like this, to do something big and exciting. I was ready for sort of that next challenge, that that, that next opportunity. And this just felt like the, the right time to do it. It's excellent. So, and you're a very valuable scientist because simply, you know, everybody in media, everybody in media likes and respects you and wants to talk to you. So. Well, that's um, kind of you. I don't get too many uh, reach outs from uh, Fox News, but. Uh, well, if you get if you did, you'd go, wouldn't you? I did once. Um, oh. I, I did an interview with John Roberts, uh, uh-huh. who, whom I knew from his CBS News. Sure, days. sure. Yeah, I know John Roberts. Yeah. Yeah. And did that it went OK or. Yeah, I felt like I yeah. got a fair interview in enemy territory. So I considered that a win. Well, I'm very excited about this new opportunity and uh, and what it's going to breed and create for for the public, much less uh, the, the the student the students at at Penn. That's very exciting, yeah. and uh, they'll be down in Philly, so uh, even easier to get down and have a beer with you. Thank Absolutely. you so Absolutely. much for joining me. Congrats on that and everything else. And I will talk to you very soon, sir. That sounds great, Pete. Okay, folks, I hope you liked my conversation with Michael Mann. I like him so much. I was so happy that he was able to join me, and I'm so happy that you listened to it today. Please tell your friends and uh, share the link to the show and write a review on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. And listen to John Carroll take us out. I'll talk to you tomorrow from the road. Be the change you want to see. Love you guys. Let the brave meet the challenge, let the meek weak flee. Boy, you better stand up, stand up. When you're tired of begging, saying pretty please, that's the time you gotta finally get up on your knees. When you can't see the forest for the burning trees, you got to stand up. Hey, you've been sitting so long, you got the creaky knees, you got to stand up. I think you're driving wheels in a leaking grease Boy, you better stand up Stand up Well, there's a whole lot more of us who know us right They'll keep right on ignoring us if we keep sitting tight You got to open up the window to let in some light You got to stand up That's right You got to rise up You got to stand up You got to stare the devil straight in the eye Off of your fence, even if it ain't a very friendly audience. Well, they'll begin to listen when you start making sense and you stand up, stand up. No need to point your rifle to the end of your town, just stand up, stand up. You know they can't deny you what you're laying down. Boy, you better stand up, stand up. Show your face of every color, yellow, black. 
black, red, and brown. She's the place where every lost child will finally be found. There's only one thing to do before we stand our ground, and that's stand up, stand up. Well, the founding fathers saw a land for all. They had to stand up, they had to stand up. They had a keen imagination for a crystal ball, drawing all the plans of the day. They knew that change was gonna come before the change could begin. They had to stand up. All right, they had to stand up. We got to stand up. We got to look the devil square in the eye. We gotta let him know it's his time to go to make it clear when all we hear is a lie. See him flee the seat of that experiment If you stand up stand All right, up. we got to speak up We got to reach up And raise your voice in every way you know how Don't be toes up, you got to show up Ain't no better time to do it but now No need to pledge allegiance to no wanton tribe Rise up, show up to the voice inside and listen well and it'll tell you not to run and hide it says stand up 